telling my ghost story. I rented a haunted house in El Paso, Texas. Anyway, back in 2011, I was living in a house in El Paso, Texas for a year with my two sons. It was a nice place with a huge yard for our dogs and three bedrooms, two dens and a two-car garage. Great place for the price. I was renting it. Also, the landlord lived almost across the street from me, so he was always close by if needed. Shortly after moving in, a matter of weeks, I was in my bedroom watching TV and unwinding from a long day. I was unemployed at the time and had received a severance check from my ex-employer and was living off of that while I was job searching. My bedroom was right across the hall from my youngest son's bedroom, and my older son had his bedroom next door to mine as he was disabled, and there were times I'd have to get up in the middle of the night if he needed to use the bathroom. Late that night, I heard singing coming through the AC vents and assumed it was my son's girlfriend, who had just moved in with us and had a great singing voice. I chalked it up to that and told myself that I would speak to my son about it in the morning. The following morning, I asked my son about it with his girlfriend there, and he told me that he thought the singing was coming from my room. They thought maybe I was watching something on TV and just turned it up to block out the sound. Weird. This house was an older house, built in 1959, and built in an L shape, with one side of the L having bedrooms and bathrooms, and the other side had the den, dining room, kitchen, another room that could be used as an office or a spare bedroom, and ended up with the garage. All doors and windows had wrought iron. It started that when we would leave the house, we would lock the wrought iron door going into the house from the garage, and many times upon our return, the door would be unlocked. The same happened when we were in the house. The door would remain unlocked while we were all inside the house, but many times, when I would have to go to the garage, the door would be locked. Also, this house had been renovated. It had new tile, carpet, cabinets, in the kitchen and such but certain rooms had these old-style push-button light switches. They would be lit if the lights in the room were off, and then you would push it and the switch would make a loud, audible double-click. sounded like a ch ch Then the lights would turn on. In the hallway, the guest bathroom's lights started turning on at different times of the night, but only when we were awake. We could be watching TV in the den and you would hear the click and the light in the bathroom would be on. No one was around when it did this. We could find no reason for it to be doing this. I remember shortly after we had moved in, I had a brother over to help me connect all my devices to connect a new Wi-Fi modem. After he was done getting everything set up, it was dark outside and he asked where the bathroom was. I told him first floor on the left down the hallway. I heard him go in, press the light switch, and as I heard him relieving himself, the house was not that big of a house. I heard the loud k'chk again, and then my brother screamed out, What the fuck? He flushed and came out. We told him we had all heard it, and told him that this was happening on a regular basis. As we were still settling in this house, I bought a touch-sensitive lamp that I could place on the table next to my son's hospital bed, so that those times when he called to me late at night, I could just go in and tap the light and have light in his room. From off, if you touch the light, once it would light dimly or low, the second touch would be a brighter medium, a third touch would put the light to his brightest setting, and of course, the fourth touch would turn it off again. Well, after about a week that this light was there, it started to turn on in the middle of the night, but it always seemed to turn on between 12 a.m. and 2 a.m., and it was always on a second medium setting, never the low or the high setting. There was no way that my disabled son would have been able to reach that light as it was to the left of his bed and out of his reach. He had limited range of motion in his arms after his car accident. This light turned on every night, without fail. There were several times that I would try to stay awake just so I could catch the light turning on and run into the room and catch our invisible culprit. 
It never worked. I could be sitting up in bed with my door open, watching for the hallway to brighten from the light being turned on. I was never able to catch it. As soon as I would start to doze off and my eyes would close, I would snap wake, and the light would already be on. At this time, I downloaded a Ghost Hunter app on my iPhone to test some things. That night, I was walking around my house, trying to get EMF readings. They were highest in my son's room. My brother was over again that night and told me I was probably picking up the electrical current from the wiring in the walls. So we decided to kill all the power in the house at the main fuse box and check the room again. Even with the power turned off, the EMF readings were highest in the guest bedroom and highest again in my disabled sunroom. One night, I had my girlfriend staying over that night and we had to have our fun. We opened the door to my room so if my son called, I could hear him. We went to sleep. I woke up with her screaming and yelling that someone was at the door. I looked and sure enough, there was a shadowy figure at the door. I'm getting goosebumps typing this. I jumped out of the bed and I saw it move to the door and I ran into the hallway. From there I saw the shape go into the bathroom, the same one that had the light being turned on by itself. I turned on the light, my hands shaking and the room was empty. I could not get my girlfriend to go back to sleep and she packed up all of her stuff and left. But the next day I decided to go across the street to speak with my landlord and tell him the strange things that were happening. It was then that he told me he had bought the house after a woman that had lived there passed on. She died in the house. And he bought it and turned it into a rental property, and it was his first tenant in that house. After I told him all of these things, he told me that he was willing to rent a video camera that he could set up in my son's room. I told him, maybe. Then we would see how these things progressed so as no one had to be harmed or whatever in the house did not seem malevolent in any way. As weeks turned into months, and each night passed, meant me waking up in the middle of the night to turn off the light in my son's room, as he would wake up eventually. The doors around the house would lock and unlock themselves. The light in the bathroom would turn on and off. We kind of got used to it. One night I was asleep in my room. I had the AC on, and a ceiling fan was on, and my El Paso summer nights can be hot as hell. Anyway, I was asleep and I was awakened by the sound of vertical blinds knocking against themselves. I wore it off, the air being moved by the fan of the AC maybe. I closed my eyes and I was just about to doze off again when I felt the air in the back of my head prick up. I closed my eyes tighter and told myself, don't look. As soon as I thought that, I felt breathing on my right ear. Plain as day and something whispered, Mother, into my ear. I yelled and jumped out of bed and turned on the lights, and nothing was there. As time moved on, I started dating another woman with three kids, and when things started to get serious between her and I, I converted the room that could be used as an office to a spare bedroom with a set of bunk beds and another small bed for his girlfriend's youngest daughter. As they would come over and start spending weekends with us, they started experiencing it too. Mostly the shadow figure. The little girl was the one that would see this the most, get scared and come into our room and jump into the bed with us. All of us had experience with the shadow, as we started to call it. There were times I would be watching TV in the den and I would feel the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I would spin around only to catch a dark streak moving away and in a second it was gone. Anyway, as our one-year lease was coming close to an end, I contacted the El Paso Paranormal Society and asked if they could come out and check out the house. I called them, sent an email by their website, never got an answer. My girlfriend and I got married. This didn't last, but that's another story. And we ended up buying a house in the same neighborhood, only three blocks away from this one. As we were almost done with our move, I was finally contacted by the El Paso Paranormal Society. Needless to say, they were anxious to come check out the house and wanted to set up an appointment about two weeks from the day of their call. I told them they were already moving to a new place and that they would not be living there any longer by the time they would be able to come out. So the guy I spoke to, time me. Make sure that the last thing that I sh should do when I leave this house for the final time would be to announce to whatever was in that house that it needed to stay there 
and that it was not allowed to follow me. His telling me this gave me the chills, but I said, sure, okay. That night, as me and my girlfriend were getting the last things out of that house, we did a final walkthrough, making sure all of the lights were off, the doors locked, etc. The landlord had already been over to inspect, just asked us to leave a light on in the house. We chose to leave the light on in the kitchen, as it had a window with vertical blinds that looked out into the driveway of the house. This way it would seem as if someone was home. As my wife and I got into each other's cars, we had our windows down and we were speaking to each other. I remember what the ghost hunter guy had told me. I yelled over to my wife, hold on a sec. I got out of the car, unlocked and opened the front door, stood in the doorway and said, whatever is in this house, this is now your house. You're not allowed to follow us. You must stay here. I backed out of the house, closed and locked the door, and got back into my car. I yelled over to my wife, Let's go! When all of a sudden, right in front of both of us, we saw one of the vertical blinds in the kitchen window move sideways, as if someone was looking out, getting chills again. We looked at each other and said, Let's get the fuck out of here. We left. I almost left one of the creepiest things. There was one morning when I awoke very early, like 4.30, and that damn light was on in my son's room again. I always tried to catch the light and it turned off before I woke my son due to his brain injury. Sleep was very important for him to have. As I walked in quietly to turn off the light, I was pissed. That had been going on so long and nightly. I tapped the light twice to turn it off and started to walk out of the room. I stopped at the foot of my son's hospital bed and said out loud, If there is something here, turn on that fucking light. And almost immediately, the light turned on. I did not realize that my son, who I thought was asleep all the time, woke up. The look of terror on his face shook me to the core. To this day, I still have nightmares about that morning and the look on his face. After that morning, I unplugged that lamp and put it away in the garage. Still, like I said, there were other things that occurred here, but the post would be easily ten times what I posted to even begin to touch on most of it. The house is real. It is located at 2921 First Street, E.P. Texas. You can Google it and see what it looks like, a normal house. You can even see the kitchen window. That is close to the driveway, and that a single vertical blind pushed sideways that last night there. Update. Now for the kicker. Since I made the original post, I've been contacted by two persons that knew this house and knew the couple that lived there. As mentioned earlier, the woman that lived there previously died in that house. What I did not know was that she died and stayed in that house undiscovered for little more than a week. Eventually the police were called in as one of the people I've contacted me about the original post to do a wellness check due to the mail and newspapers starting to pile up and no one answering the door when they would knock. After the police gained access to the house, she was found dead in the hallway. BTWN, my son's room, and the bathroom, and the light would turn off and on at times of the night. Also, I was told this lady that lived in the house became very hangry and hateful as she grew older. She was paranoid and developed dementia. She became so hateful and cruel that she alienated all of her family, even her husband, who eventually moved out and paid the bills while she lived there alone. When she passed, the husband, this lady kept the urn with his ashes on the kitchen table and looked out in front of the driveway, the same window that had the vertical blind pushed sideways as if someone was looking out at me and my wife at the time of our last night, the house when we moved out. I was told that the room that my son slept in, that the lady suffered more and more from dementia, she made a shrine of sorts, with paper after paper, taped to the wall, asking God to save her, to not hate her, to forgive her, for her family to love her. The same wall when my son was set up in that room had his medals from track and cross country, pictures of his friends, newspaper articles. I was even told by the same person that when she was younger, one of the lady's daughters told her, this neighbor's witness, when this daughter was a child, that she did not like to be in that room because a dark smoke came out of the outlet at night. The same outlet that my son had his touch lamp plugged into. 
this means that there is also something in that house even while the couple that lived there were both alive. As told by me, by this same witness, this house was the first house built in the subdivision back in 1959. I wonder now, what was it built over? Believe me when I say there is much more that happened in this house that did not cover. So much, in fact, that I'd always thought about writing about it as a book. My own tests and traps that I set up to try to document proof were kind of crazy too. I went so far as dusting a metal dome of a touch lamp with corn flour to see if there would ever be prints. Running thread the same color of the carpet an inch from the floor across my son's doorway so that it was almost unseen, hoping to see the string snapped from whatever entered my son's room at night. Never got a damn thing. It has been years since I lived there, and this house is very close to my son's mother's house. The time that I have to go over there, to my ex's house, I make it to a point, I drive by this place. There are new tenants there, well not new as they have lived there since shortly after I moved out. I always wonder if they too are having experiences there. Ghosts are real, hauntings are real. I think and believe that both my son and I both had very close calls with almost dying, another story for another time, that this made us more susceptible and open to the entities in that house. Anyway, the story is all true, the house is real, I do not know if the new tenants had any new experiences, and I see no reason to go back to that house and find out. The Swimming Hole This is an actual event that took place just a few nights ago. The incident actually happened and scared the heck out of me, which is actually not that easy to do anymore. So this past Wednesday night, I decided that I was going to go over to my family cemetery to do some EVP and video work. Now I do this a lot in my family cemetery, and I get some good EVP activity there. Normally I stop about a mile down the road at an old small county church. I do this to pray for protection because my great-grandfather owned and preached there as well as my great-uncle. But for some reason, I didn't stop there. Instead, I went to another spot down the road from the cemetery. I pulled off the road into a drive on some vacant property that my aunt and uncle owned. It was surrounded by thick wooden hills and a creek right across the road. I backed into the driveway and I parked with the lights on and motor running. I started my video recording and began explaining what I was doing this night. And as I'm talking, I'm facing the creek. I took note that this was one of those nights where it was very dark, no moonlight or anything. And at one point, I thought I saw something pop up over the creek bank and ducked back down quickly. I really didn't pay it any mind and kept narrating my video, only to realize that it did it again. I noted mentally that it appeared to be a human type head, either a pale or whitish gray. I wasn't feeling scared or anything, but I did realize that the air felt heavier than before, and I pressed onward until I raised up the third time, and I stopped talking because I heard what I thought was a deep male voice, faint, but I heard it. Then in that moment it hit me hard, the fight or flight feeling, that gut instinct for self-preservation. I then felt as if something dark or evil was approaching and that it meant serious business. I said out loud, no, 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 I gotta get out of here now, right now. It felt as if I was watching a pissed off Kodiak grizzly running at me full bore to eat me alive. I threw the truck into drive and punched the gas, getting away from the area as quick as possible. I began reciting the Lord's Prayer and praying out loud while demanding that whatever entity had gotten into the truck with me get out. There was a loud double thump directly behind my seat. I yelled very loudly to get out, get out now. I was still praying when I cut the wheel and turned the church lot. Then I called out to the great grandpa and my great uncle to help remove whatever climbed into the truck with me. Between out of the driveway and pulling into the church lot, I was jumped twice. Each time was very strong and it took my breath away. It felt as if every drop of adrenaline had dumped into my system. They felt like a strong panic attack, but worse. I've been told that what happens, 
the spirit you have encountered is jumping into your body, giving you a very serious warning. I've had it happen a few times at other locations, but never that hard or strong. But after praying out loud for several minutes, the air felt much lighter and the gut feeling subsided. I started reviewing my video and audio and found that just as I said, no, 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 there was a faint male voice that says, attack him, and that it did. Now the creek across from where I parked has a dark history. My mom and my dad, as well as their brothers and sisters, all were raised right in that area. There's a deep hole right there, and they would all go down there and swim as kids and teenagers. One of my uncles had a best friend that drowned in that hole back in 1960. My uncle also drowned down there in the early 1970s, but was revived. It was also the site of a fatal car crash accident where a young male that was getting ready to leave for Vietnam lost control of his 57 Chevy, and the car ended up that far in the bank and caught fire. The car was never pulled out, and some of it is still there today. My grandmothers both told me, as long as I can remember to stay out of that hole unless I wanted to die. I don't know what I encountered the other night, but it definitely was upset that I was there, and it felt evil to say the least. Experience from a Skeptic I will keep the recap of my experience brief, but I want to warn readers that the end result is probably very mundane compared to other things you have heard. So when a very close friend of mine had passed away about five years ago, my entire family was very close to her and she had been romantically involved with a sibling of mine for years up to that point. Needless to say, I was devastated to see her go so young. She was in her mid-twenties and my sibling and her partner wanted to attempt a seance to contact her. We were by no means professionals at this nor were any of us particularly knowledgeable on the subject, not even at a casual level, so the possibility that we screwed something up along the way is nearly guaranteed. It was myself, my siblings mentioned above, my brother, and a mutual friend of ours. Another friend of mine was in the room as well, but he was not participating. Probably not a good idea, I know. For the most part, the seance was uneventful, I don't even remember most of what constituted the ritual, but there was one thing that stuck out to each of us. During the session, we heard a singular knock from inside the house. It came from a door right next to the kitchen, where we were performing the seance and led downstairs to the basement. There were no people nor pets downstairs at the time, so I'm not sure what could have created the sound. I do have some non-paranormal ideas in my head. Somebody in the group may have somehow faked it without me noticing, for example. But I'm curious to know what people think I could have been from a paranormal perspective, if at all. Bleeding Castle Walls This is a story from my dad that he told me a few years ago, and I asked if I could share it on this sub, and he agreed. For context, this was around the late 80s, in the UK, and my dad was visiting a place called Chillingham Castle for a school trip. As some of you may or may not know, castles around the UK are known for being quite haunted, and Chillingham is not an exception. However, the experience my dad had is quite different to anything I've heard of before. There is a courtyard in the center of the castle, and my dad's tour group had been shown around it previously and began to move on to another area of the castle. However, my dad had managed to misplace his hat and assumed he'd left it in the courtyard. After telling his teacher, he split off from the group to return to the courtyard and entered it. He quickly spotted his hat on the ground and grabbed it. But when he raised his head up to the stand, the courtyard walls were coated completely in dark red blood. The blood oozed down the walls slowly and quite literally was everywhere on every single wall even the windows. Obviously terrified, he ran straight out of the courtyard and back to our tour group as fast as possible and told a few of his mates, but none of them believed him. The group briefly passed near the courtyard again when my dad looked at all the blood disappeared completely. 
He said that he swears to this day it happened, but has no idea how or why. Does anyone have any similar stories? I recently went over to a friend's house to investigate some phenomena that have been happening at her apartment. She thinks it has been her Nona, but I warned her it could be something else. I walked in, brought my spirit box and SLS camera. There was definitely someone there, but I couldn't make out if it was in good or a bad spirit. As I was explaining what the devices there were, my friend was about to say her Nona's name, but I warned her to stop. If you come across a spirit and is acting friendly, someone who lost someone would think, oh, it's my grandfather, or something along those lines. You never want to say the person you lost's name, and even think that other spirits can blurt out the exact name and pretend to be that person close to you. But really, they are not friendly and will attach or drain your energy. After I told her this, I told her a story about my great-grandfather, specifically stating their name. Three minutes later, I ask if the person in the room with us, what is your name? Albert, my great-grandfather's name. I looked at her and I said, there's your evidence right there. How do I know what that, it's not my great-grandfather. He and I are not on speaking terms. We just got into a fight. He went away for a while, so I knew it could not. Also, some of you might think, oh, it could actually be the spirit's name. The way it was said and how it continued with the conversation based on what I told my Fred about my GG. I definitely knew it was not. So please be careful. What you say out loud the next time you think you're trying to communicate with spirits, a better thought would be, may I have your name? Can I ask who I'm speaking to? Something along those lines. Stay safe out there. My terrifying experience in college. I was in my freshman year of college. I was doing well mentally, a lot of thoughts jumping in my mind. My room was fairly sized. I had one roommate. We were doing fine. Halfway through the winter semester, I got a horrible feeling of anxiety in this room. If I went to my friend's room, it would be fine, but I always felt like something was watching me in mine. My roommate also started to feel this way. She would constantly be getting sleep paralysis and horrid dreams. She finally had enough and started sleeping at her boyfriend's. So I was alone. Everything was gloomy. I had to sleep with some lights on because it just felt like someone was there. About two days later, my roommate's still not there. I go to bed and I hear breathing. It wasn't close to me, but I could still hear it. I was facing my roommate's bed. Behind me was a brick wall. I open my eyes, and I see this black figure laying down on her bed. I silently freaked out but tried to stay still and kept watching. And when I did, I sat up. It looked at me. It had burgundy red eyes. And like a black mist emitting from its body, I hated that. Immediately turned into the brick wall and started saying some mantras. Not my first spirit and covered my face with the blankets. When I thought that it was going to be okay, I stopped, and all of a sudden I felt something right near me, and the spirit in my ear said, If you sleep tonight, I will kill you. Huh. I was terrified. I tried not to sleep, but I accidentally passed out, and oh boy, that dream I had that night was weird. Basically, I was in a desert with these people sitting in a circle, and in the middle was a dark figure, they started chanting, and I was scared to say anything. I had no idea what was being said. But the leader was yelling at me to chant with them. But it was too late, and the dark figure stabbed me in the heart. And I just laid there. Until, like, this blue fire rose around me, and these circles with lines on the sides appeared all over my body. And I started chanting, and the dark figure died? I woke up, falling out of bed, and clutched my chest, because I felt like something stabbed me but no blood, no open wounds. I never saw that spirit again after that. I called my RA, and she said last year some girls had the same experience with a dark figure with red eyes. They ended up blessing the room after the semester was open. Definitely freaky. Hated every second of it. 
menacing memory. I was about 15 years old, living in a rented house with my mom. My bedroom was on the front of the house, and my bed had two mattresses on it, a spring mattress on the bottom and a soft foam mattress on the top. My bed was positioned on the outer center wall under the window. I woke up one night for no particular reason, but felt uneasy in this heavy, quiet sensation in the corner of the room, diagonally opposite my bed, in the corner of the inner walls of the room. Something was clinging to the ceiling and walls. It was almost completely transparent, but the light was distorted, bending around the curvatures and edges of its form. It was humanoid in shape, but devoid of features. It hung there in the top right of the corner of the opposite wall as if it had been back-pressed into the corner, and its feet and hands were upside its body, sort of like how Spider-Man might hang in such a spot. Although I'm not sure I'd seen any Spider-Man content. This was 20 years ago, and I didn't read comics. It had been watching me sleep. When it saw I was awake, it started moving along the top of the far wall, closer to my bed. Then it started moving along the ceiling towards me. It didn't have its limbs. It was more like it hovered along its path. I was paralyzed with fear and my heart was racing. This thing came across the ceiling until it was directly above me and then slowly descended down over me and my mattress sunk down with the weight of it where its limbs pressed into the mattress on both sides of me as if it were on all fours, leaning down into my face. All I could do was squeeze my eyes shut, turn my face away, screaming in my head over and over again for this thing to go away. Only a few moments later, everything returned to normal. I heard ambient sound return, waves from the nearby ocean and the wind outside. I could pull my blanket up, so it mustn't have been a bed anymore. Without even opening my eyes, I didn't want to see if it was still there. I pulled the blanket up over my head and stayed there under the blanket. My mom's cat, who doesn't like me, came and hopped up onto my bed, laid on my chest to sleep, which was unusual. This bears a lot of hallmarks of sleep paralysis, and as an adult, I found out my brother suffered with sleep paralysis a lot as a child, but didn't know what was happening. This whole experience was extremely vivid and malevolent, though, and to this day, it's kept me guessing about what's happened that night. It's been 20 years. My haunted experiences. I grew up in a small town in Indiana, from kindergarten all the way up to fifth grade. My grandfather was a landlord and let me, my mom, brother, and later down the road, my soon-to-be-born sister, live in this house. I grew up religious, but my mom never forced up to believe what she believed. She wanted us to think for ourselves and learn about other religions and decide what we wanted. But I still don't know whether I believe in ghosts. I do believe in angels and demons. The first story, well, didn't happen at my house, is a good backstory to how I became fascinated with the paranormal. I will title the first story, The Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper I was a baby, I believe, or at least still young enough to sleep in a crib. My grandparents on my dad's side had always been a big part of my life, and I still, at the age of 22, try to go up as much as possible. One night, I was laid down in my crib. I remember waking up and staring at the posters in my father's room. My grandparents never took them down, and still to this day, they are up. These posters are on a large piece of wood that is hung from the ceiling and is in the back of a large train track my grandfather built. One of the pictures always used to scare me. It was of a circus and the tiger had snarled up nose and large teeth. The storage room also in this bedroom. It's normally filled with Christmas decorations and board games. My grandma always told us not to go in there because things could fall and she didn't want us to get hurt. As I turned over in my crib, someone walked out. Not someone I recognize. This man was tall and completely black, wearing what I can only describe as a cloak with a large hood. 
this thing walked out of the storage room, out of my bedroom door, and down the stairs. This object moved slowly and looked almost transparent. I don't remember being scared or crying. I still sleep in that room today. I remembered it as if it was yesterday. Being that young, seeing things I couldn't explain, I believe it conditioned me to see and experience the things I saw, felt, and heard in my home, such as the lady on the ceiling. The lady on the ceiling. My brother and I are two years apart in age and have always been two peas in a pod. My first experience in this house was not something I saw, but rather felt. I wasn't in kindergarten, and I had a room to myself. Sometimes, when I was scared, I would sense a woman in my room. I never saw her, but I always had a picture of her in my mind. She wasn't on the ceiling, but I never pictured her standing on the ground. I knew it was a woman's presence. I felt this woman for six years until we eventually moved out. The Attic Door Temperature Change Like I said, my brother's room was right next to mine connected by the hallway, think of a conjoined hotel room, but was always cold. Even though we had central heating and cooling, his door was never shut because I found some comfort in being able to see him at night. His room had an attic attached to it. This door was thick and old. The only thing keeping it locked was a barrel bolt lock. The floor was weak and we could fall through the ceiling if we're to go in there. At least, that's what my mom said. Sometimes, when we would wake up, the door would be open. My mom thought it was us for a while. We told her it wasn't, and she made it very clear it was dangerous and we would get hurt. My brother and I just got used to it and would just close it and lock it if we saw it open. It didn't stop there. It began to move through the house. Bumps in the night. This story happened to my mom. We lived in town, so hearing people talk outside wasn't that big of a deal. Everyone knew everyone, and sometimes people would sit on our porch and smoke a cigarette. We always heard people talking. The closer you got to the talking, the farther away you got. You would look outside and no one would be there. You could never make out what they were seeing. Sometimes it was angry, and sometimes it sounded like a normal conversation. And then the ghost, demon, entity began ringing our doorbell. The doorbell. The doorbell always rang, day and night. At first we thought it was my friend's ding-dong ditching my house. But it only did that at certain times. We told my friends to stop, and they were persistent it wasn't them. When we would be casually having a conversation and say a number in a sentence, you can have two pieces of cake, and the doorbell would ring two times. It took us a while to catch on, and we started engaging, telling the spirit to ring it five times, and it would. We started having some fun. My mom wasn't a huge fan, but my friend and I decided to take some EVPs. EVPs. The only prominent EVP I ever caught was on a flip phone. My friend and I went into the bathroom and started asking questions. We told the spirit to touch us. We told them that we can stand normal or in a funky fashion in a man's voice. It said real fast, funky fashion. I don't remember being touched and neither does she, but when we played it back, you could hear it. We showed my mom and you could tell she believed us but blew it off. Later that week, I went to my grandma's, the one with the possessed storage room. And little did I know, my mom had the house blessed by her friends who hunted ghosts. They said it should help. Boy, were they wrong. It helped for a little, but things got more sinister. Filament in the bulbs. The filament in light bulbs is a thing that produces light. When light bulbs bust or blow, it's the thing you can hear shaking around in the glass. We were having a cookout, and again, this is one of my mom's stories. She went into the bathroom and heard a sight, tink sound, almost as if you were lightly tapping on a spoon on a glass. 
She flipped the lights on and looked in the mirror. It was the mall. Five light bulbs blew. Not just blew, exploded. Like something in a horror movie. It was one at a time. She didn't notice until she brought her friend in to show him. And she said it was almost impossible because all five of the filaments were intact. He said they should have separated. Shortly after we started sleeping in my mom's bed. Glass shatter with Bible. My brother and I liked when my mom read to us. And we found comfort in her reading to us the Bible for some reassurance. One night my mom was reading us verses. My brother and I were scared the spirit, what I believe now to be a demon, would touch us. She read. John chapter 5 verses 1821. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who has born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. It was when she told us we would be safe because the devil can scare us, the devil can make bad things happen in our life, but he cannot touch us as long as we believe in God. It was at that time another was heard. As soon as we were quiet, the glass of water my mom was sitting beside her exploded, exploded. She told us that she had dropped it coming up the stairs, but years later she told us she had no idea why it had exploded. We had the house blessed again by the same people, and they told us the small hallway between my brother and I's room was a portal with high readings. We later moved out of the house to a town about 30 minutes away. My grandfather reinvented the house out to another family mentor and visited his house. My brother and I were told not to tell the kids about we had, what we had experienced. We promised, but after a month, that family had packed up and moved to Michigan without notice. About a year ago, I was telling these stories to a girl we adopted during quarantine, as she is easily scared, and I thought it would be funny. I decided to Google search the house to do a virtual tour since it is empty again, to give her a visual of where things happened. When you Google the address, nothing pops up. It's as if the house doesn't exist. When you Google Earth the address, there's nothing. I located my grandfather's address because he lived next door and took the cursor down the street. What I saw was shocking. I won't tell you what I saw, so you are completely unbiased and can draw the conclusion for yourself. Circular ghost? When I was five or six, my grandmother died, and my mom traveled overseas to attend her funeral. When she returned, I could not sleep, or maybe I missed my mom. So she allowed me to sleep in her bed that night. I was awakened at some point that night and saw a circular light on the wall. I guess I was smart enough to look at the curtain because I thought someone was shining a light into the room but the curtains were drawn and there was no light on them. My mom's dresser that had a mirror mounted to it sat diagonally in the corner of the room. After looking at the curtain, I turned my eyes back to the light, which was now sinking below the horizon of the top of the mirror, just like the sun sets. Within seconds, it completely sank and was hidden behind the mirror. At that point, I woke up my mom and said to her, about the light, and then went back to sleep. Several years later, I remembered this event and mentioned it to my mother. She told me that when I awoke her, that I told her an old lady woke me up. She concluded that it was the spirit of her mother who was checking on her after a flight home. I only told this story a few times over the years, and every time goosebumps would form on my arms. Met something in Night Park. It's right on the edge of the city, and while the park looks like about two square miles of wild nature, it's surrounded with city from three sides, and with suburban area and mall from the fourth. Thus, it's not some wild lands of Bigfoots, but apparently this place has something. As always after work, I sometimes go to this park at night. Place is safe. No animals bigger than a squirrel. So, 
nothing to worry about. This time, I decided not to walk by its trails and alleys, but to go in the distant part, where all the bottom of wide ravine flows a small, about two meter wide and shallow stream, supporting local ponds. Shores are open and have some sticky black clay on them in some spots, and local village long time ago was named Black Mud after this. But in many places, in a meter or two from the shore, starts bushes and trees. I was going by this shore, night is clear enough, and no trees above the stream, so I could see without a flashlight, nothing suspicious, only ordinary night forest sounds. Then I saw some movement behind the bushes in front of me where the stream turns from my shore. Here I should add, that overall while I'm a bit afraid of darkness, yes it's a strange combination, with the night park walks. I got used to the night park, visited it for years, so almost every part is very familiar to me. Besides, it's all surrounded by civilization. So, I saw some movement in those bushes, about 15 meters from me. Slowly, trying not to make a sound by stepping on some crunchy branch on the shore, I walked forwards. Between the bushes there was some free space, enough for me to get forwards in between. Behind them there was a small meadow, and then, here it's hard for me to tell. My mind since then makes me think that I saw a dog, but I can't remember, no visual of dog, no, no breed, no size, nothing. I do not remember what I saw there, but what I did next, I instinctively rushed backwards to the stream, took from the ground the biggest branch I could, and ran away from there, looking backwards often, but there was nothing. I stopped only on the hill in a half of a mile, overlooking the foresty ravine bottom around the stream. It was calm and quiet. I finally dropped my stick, and confused, went home. So far... I have no idea what it could be, but back then I was in like a panic mode for a few minutes, and then it was okay again, like an on-off switch. The Man in Brown An interesting tale when I was nine. So I've had some experiences in my life where I had looked back and really had a hard time understanding and taking them for what they were. I think we've all had these, and we look for the time and place to explore for answers. We keep these experiences in our minds more than others, and they stay. So for a little background, this story takes place in my family's home. My family's had this land since the 40s, I believe. My parents had received a plot of land from my family in the 80s, and they had built a home. We've been there ever since. So this story is a quick one, and I will get to it. When I was nine, around 2001, I believe I was at home alone with my older brother. Our parents had gone out for the evening. This is probably around 3 p.m., which makes this so strange. We were hanging out, and I had to go use the restroom, and for whatever reason, I chose to leave the door open. Preference. So I set it there, doing my thing, and I remember looking toward the door, and all of a sudden a man in a brown suit walked past the doorway. When this happened, I remember not thinking of anything, for whatever reason. My brother was in the living room, so anyone who walked down the hallway, he would have watched them pass him. I walked out of there, back to where he was, and asked him who that was, and he had no idea what I was talking about, and left it at that. Just about eight years later, I remember bringing it up to my brother, after never saying anything about it, and he remembered exactly what I was talking about. He remembered me asking who it was there, and he didn't know what I was talking about. Then for him, it was just his nine-year-old brother, asking him something weird. The man walked by that day and didn't look at me or anything. Just walked by, and never seen him again. Oh. Well... How it always went on with that one. The Gray in the Night. True story that happened to me and some friends. This happened in northeastern Oklahoma, within the Cherokee Reservation, around 2008, in the beginning of fall. Myself and eight other friends, 
went to school. We all met up with our friend's house to hang out for the night around a campfire and listen to music. We all were about 15 or 16 years old. My friend had a trail that went maybe over a quarter of a mile into the woods where it led to an open circle in the wooded area. There was a fire pit with a single tree and another trail that led south from the opening where we'd be hanging out for the night. We sat around this and that bullshitting into the night and may I remind you, we are not partying. No bruise, no smoke, no nothing. Just nine of us out in the woods having a good time. It gets around 2.30 or 3 and things changed. We are all having a good time and my friend T. John gets up and heads to the entrance of the south trail at the edge of the cut out to take a piss. I just happened to look up from the fire and turned to look at him and up from him in the trail this gray figure stood in front of him about 20 yards away. I asked him quietly if he saw it and he looks up and comes back to the fire with the rest of us. My eyes are locked on this figure standing in the dark. This thing standing about seven feet tall with a static, cloudy look to it. Its legs started about where the bottom of one's chest plate would be. Long, lanky arms which lay down along where its knees would be with black, hollow eyes with no mouth or nose. All nine of us are staring at this thing and no one can move. Some started to cry. Some kept their heads down, but I kept my eyes right on it looking at this thing while it stood there looking right back at us. It moved horizontally to the right into the woods off the south trail, slowly moving around. It got to the part in the woods that during the day you could see was about a seven foot rock wall. When it approached, it hovered over this wall with no struggles at all, then slowly backed off into the darkness of the woods. We stayed there till the sun came up, then we got out of there. We never talked about that until about 15 years after. Some of them became my best friends. And then they can recall that night, just as I did in this post. Went to that spot a few times after it. At a night we never saw anything. Looking back, did we really see something or was it just a case of mass hysteria? I can see it in my mind, clear as day. I don't know what would happen if I saw it again. Old Jail After Dark Experience St. Augustine, Florida My wife and I love watching paranormal-themed shows. We've watched nearly every episode of every popular ghost hunting show there is, currently watching old episodes of Kindred Spirits. We traveled down to St. Augustine, Florida last year for a week, and we had a lot of fun. We did a haunted bar crawl checked out the fort, old town, and the beach. My wife discovered a tour entitled The Old Jail After Dark, which is essentially an opportunity to do a paranormal investigation of the old jail. This location has been featured on a few of the paranormal TV shows, Ghost Hunters especially. The price tag was $100 per person, and you began at midnight and ran through 2 a.m. You'd be given essentially the same equipment you see on the TV show, and the ability to investigate the jail. My wife and I decided to do it and planned it a few days out. In the meantime, we did the daytime tour to learn more information about the history of the location, which we felt would become in handy for the investigation itself. We arrived at the jail shortly before midnight and was taken next door to the museum area where chairs were set up and a table with equipment on it. We ended up being one of the two couples of the investigation the website states up to 12 could be allowed at once. And when booking the site, they told you how many spots were available, so we chose a night with a lot of availability, hoping to be part of a small group. We succeeded. A guy named Francis, who was very, very nice, led our investigation for the evening. He gave us a rundown on what to expect, the time limit, the rules and restrictions, as well as the rundown on the equipment. The wife and I were pretty familiar with it. The other couple somewhat was too, so we spent more time on the non-equipment spiel. One thing of note, we had to wait a few minutes after this 
before being brought over next door. I also found it interesting we weren't briefed inside the jail, but next door at the museum. So we were brought over into the jail and into the kitchen where all the equipment was staged. We were then told that since we were a small group, we would be given free reign over the jail, as typically they have larger groups and Francis likes to split them up as to not contaminate evidence. The equipment we had available to us, FILR, thermal camera, K2 meter, REM pod, spirit box, dousing rods, and a boo buddy. There was also a laser grid set up at the sheriff's office on the door leading to the backyard as it tends to open on its own. Some context. The jail had no running water, even up until it isn't in the 60s. The sheriff's name was Joe Perry, and he was an absolute tyrant and terror. I won't give you the entire story of the jail, but thought these might be important. We grabbed a thermal cam, K2 meter, spirit box, and an REM pod and began investigating. The investigation. Solitary confinement, death row. We started in solitary confinement and death row, which was just off from the kitchen downstairs. We set out the REM pod, turned on the K2 meter, and had the thermal cam going. We entered the solitary confinement cell and got no readings. No REM pod hits. My wife was recording audio on her phone. After reviewing nothing, we crossed the hall to a regular cell and got a few hits on the K2. I turned on the spirit box and got a garbled response. The K2 did seem to respond to questions. I must note that my wife and I began our investigation of each new area, announcing ourselves and that we came in respect, and that if they wished to communicate with us, they could. We wanted to be respectful as possible to any spirits that may have been there. We completed our investigation here and moved on to the two women's cells. Women's cells. This was our first real activity of the night. There were two women's cells right off a of death row and the kitchen. Women were forced to work in the kitchen. So we introduced ourselves and I asked for permission to enter the cell. I sat in REM pod at the top bunk and had a K2 in hand. We explained the equipment and began asking questions. We weren't getting much until I asked if they didn't like using the bucket they had to use the bathroom in. The REM pod began going off at the mention of the word bucket. I asked for confirmation and got a second REM pod response. We asked a few additional questions and didn't get a response including did you like the sheriff? I asked if the sheriff was still there and the REM pod went off. When we announced we were leaving, the REM pod began going off. We thanked the spirits and sympathized with them. This was also caught on the camera with audio. General population. We went upstairs to the gen pop area and entered into the cells. Cells are open on two sides with an area beside each side that's open for inmates to mingle but still locked on either side as guards can walk around the perimeter of the cells, and sat at the metal table. We sat the REM pod on the table as well as the K2 meter. My wife begins recording audio on her phone. Francis is also joining us as well as the other couple is, which is investigating on the outer perimeter of the cells. So everyone we knew about involved in the investigation that night is all in this one area we began by introducing ourselves, as usual, and asking pointed questions. The REM pod begins lighting up like the 4th of July, and I had asked the spirit box to back off some numerous times. We asked it if it was an innate to light it up again and it went off loudly. This was all captured on audio. Also captured on audio were a couple of EVPs. During our line of questioning, when the REM pod wasn't going off, I heard a faint whisper that said, Kill Joe. I enhanced the evidence, and it seemed to be definitely spoken words. A few minutes later, we caught another EVP of a whisper saying, Joe, die. My wife asked if a spirit could tell us their name. There is a very immediate response and a breathy no. In the interest of time, we decided to move on the sleeping quarters across the way. Sleeping quarters. 
We spent 20 to 25 minutes here and caught no evidence. Kitchen. We sat the REM pod by the coffee grinder. Women spent hours here and asked questions. No answers. Francis enters and we start talking and shooting the breeze a bit. My wife once again is recording audio on her phone. I have the spirit box on hand and ask if the innate is female. And the male voice responds, Yes. Fran and I laugh about it since it was a male voice. Shortly after this, I began feeling a tingling in my hand, and suddenly my spirit box as well, as the other spirit box that was on the counter, both die simultaneously. This was also caught on audio. Shortly after that, this gargling voice is heard saying something like, I'm dead. Sounds very Crypt Keeper-like. This was captured on audio only. My wife stayed in the kitchen with Fran, and I ventured across the foyer into the sheriff's office. The Sheriff's Office Part 1 I'm alone in the sheriff's office, with just the spirit box. I'm asking questions and getting no responses. I've been in the room maybe seven or eight minutes when I asked, How many people are in this room? When the spirit box responds immediately with, You. I immediately went back to the kitchen to report this to my wife and Fran. Backyard area. All five of us are now in the backyard area where they hung people, and we're just walking around. We're not capturing anything on the K2 meter or REM pod. I have the spirit box on, and I'm sitting on one of the benches. Everyone else is standing around. I ask how many people are standing out here, to which the spirit box responds with, four which was correct, as I was the only one sitting. This was only evident and captured here. Sheriff's Office Part 2 All five of us reconvene and investigate the Sheriff's Office together. We have only the spirit box and K2s, as well as the laser grid focused on the back door. I felt like since I had success with asking number-themed questions, I'd continue that. So I asked, How many people are in this room? to which it immediately responded, five. I asked how many women are in this room, and it immediately responded with two. Then I asked how many mannequins are in this room, and it responded with two, all correct answers. Fran was beside himself, and more excited than I was in Christmas 1998 when I got my N64. Sometime later, I'm seated in a chair. Wife is next to me. Fran is by the laser grid, and the other couple next to him. There is a double-sided fireplace in the middle of the room, and the spirit box is on the mantel. I didn't hear it. I wasn't paying attention, but apparently my name was spoken through the spirit box. It was quiet, and suddenly I heard what sounded like boots walking on the hardwood floor in the office moving towards us. I could tell the wife and the other couple had heard it too, and asked if anyone heard that. She confirmed. Kitchen debriefing. It was around 3 a.m. and Fran was shutting things down and debriefing us in the kitchen, letting us know that if we captured anything, where we could send it, and was giving us instructions, and when we leave, let the spirits know they can't come with us, and suddenly he stops. Apparently, I was the only one that didn't hear a female-sounding cry. As he continued the debriefing, he stopped again, and this time all we heard was sounded like a conversation coming from upstairs. Male voices. As he closed out the night, he told us he wished they had an additional camera crew following us around that night, as we caught a lot of evidence. He said we have enough for two shows worth. Whether or not some of the stuff was tampered with by a third party elsewhere, the EVPs were very creepy and the overall experience was fun. We had a blast and never really felt threatened, although at times I could feel I wasn't alone. Could have been a natural feeling brought on by my circumstances. I would highly recommend the tour. Never knew what might happen. I'll add Fran did disclose that it may be possible we could go all night and catch nothing. Okay, so I live in Montana. So if you're from my neck of the woods, you'll know this place I'm talking about. Me and my family lived in a small town called Sims. Yes, this is where the town is called. And for a while, we owned and lived 
at the restaurant slash bar, The Fireside. It was old and was one of the first buildings that was built in the town. The front of this place was a bar and restaurant. The back was the original old house that was made first where we lived. Nothing ever happened back there. The setup was simple and we had the bar at the very front with tables all around. The floor for anyone who didn't want to sit at the bar itself. The kitchen was behind the bar, and to the left of the bar when you walked was the counter and a door that led to the kitchen. And the more parallel to the kitchen was the dining room. It was a bit more fancy looking, with red carpet and cushioning on the chairs. It had lighting that was supposed to be romantic. I guess because it was creepy to me, we had three ghosts. Well, I say three, but that might be the case with one of them. There was an old farmer-looking man who sat at the bar all the time. He seemed rather friendly, and I never felt afraid of him. He didn't really do much, but showed up at the end of the bar and sat. My grandma thought, in life, he must have visited the bar a lot, and after his death, he stuck around. In the kitchen, he had an older woman who seemed much older than the man at the bar, and not by looking older. I mean, she seems to have been here when the place was first built. She looked like a settler, and she was far more active than the man thought. I never saw her. I never felt scared in the kitchen. One time my grandma was cooking, and suddenly next to her she saw the woman who pointed at the food and said, That's wrong, dear, and vanished. The person who had the most interaction with the woman was the waitress we had hired. She would come into the kitchen, turn on the lights, go out for a moment, come back and the lights would be off. Or she would turn on the burners on the oven stove, turn around back and the burners are off. The woman just seemed mischievous at most. Then there was the dining room and that fucking thing I hated going into the dining room, but everyone did. My mom wouldn't go in there by herself. It was not confined to one place like the others. It went wherever it wanted. But most of the time, it was in the dining room, in the back left corner where it was pretty dark. It just sat in a chair. It would look at you. Now you may be asking, what did it look like? All I can say is it looked like a human-shaped black hole. But it didn't stay like that all the time. My mother was in the kitchen once, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw a woman. Thinking nothing of it, she continued to just finish cleaning up when suddenly a plate was thrown full force at her head. It scared the shit out of her. She knew right then and there that that was not a woman but a thing looking at her. And before you say demon, my grandma has this demonic experience, and the thing in the fireside was not a demon. It felt different. She would tell me a demon feels hungry. This thing felt like the absence of anything, even I felt that. Recently, years later, I'm 20, and my mom told me a story about the thing I didn't know. So there's been a part there where some balloons and my mom and dad are sitting in the main area, and suddenly one of the balloons begins to move. Moved from the main area to the dining room, came back out, and was let go. That was the only interaction my dad had with it, but he seemed to be ghost repellent, so I didn't know.